Hello, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm an independent consultant, hands-on software architect, and also the founder of developer2architect.com. In today's lesson, lesson 15, we'll take a look at refactoring architecture, but specifically forming a business justification when we're doing refactoring. As a matter of fact, let's start out this short lesson with some sort of context where we have a monolithic application and it's too tightly coupled, which is giving us some technology pain. But more specifically, we realize as an architect, it's growing way beyond what the current architecture can support. And what we see is that if we do split that application into multiple deployable units, uh, we'll be able to decouple components and allow for more growth. So this is my idea as an architect. So we need to justify this kind of architecture refactoring to split into a service-based or even a microservices kind of ecosystem, but also more importantly, the business justification. So here's what we'd like to do. We'd like to split our monolithic application into multiple deployable units, and this will decouple components and allow for more growth. Well, technically, I can easily justify this because components will therefore, in my overall architecture, be more decoupled, so it should eliminate those frequent build and deployment issues. Also, each one of those separately deployed units will use fewer virtual machine resources, thereby increasing performance and allowing more growth. And finally, deployment is limited to a separate application unit, thereby it should reduce deployment time and increase the overall robustness. Let's pay for this, everybody. <clears throat> well, notice some of these words I'm using. Decoupled, JVM resources, separate application unit, robustness. Well, no business user is ever going to pay for this. As a matter of fact, I'm guessing you'll get the response like this. Well, can't we just simply buy more JVMs? What? Well, to solve this problem, can't we buy more JVMs? What is a JVM? Oh, JVM. No, that's a Java virtual machine. Well, can't we just buy some more of those? I mean, how much are they? The point is many business users, as a matter of fact, most business users will not understand this kind of technical justification. What we need to do as architects is to form a business justification. Why should the business pay for this? You know, so many things can be justified technically. Increase in performance is a great example, yet the business justification, well, we don't need faster applications. And do you see the difference here? That it's easy to form a technical justification, but in order to really be a responsible architect, we have to form what is the business value? In other words, why should the business pay for it? <clears throat> so I want to split the monolithic application into multiple deployable units. So here's a good business justification. New functionality can be delivered faster, therefore improving the overall time to market. As a matter of fact, I can demonstrate that overall application quality will be improved, therefore reducing the bugs and the associated costs of fixing those bugs. And finally, development and deployment costs associated with developing new functionality will be reduced. Look at the words I'm using here. Time to market. Quality will be improved, reducing bugs in the associated costs, significantly reducing cost. This, the business will pay for. <clears throat> usually, it's quite interesting. When we go to justify business value, we can usually rely on three kind of metrics. Reducing overall cost, better time to market, and better user satisfaction. But here's the trick as an effective software architect. We can't just do lip service and say, oh, yeah, 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 we'll reduce all this. No, we have to be able to accurately measure this and to be able to demonstrate it that we did, in fact, reduce cost. Let's take a look at each of these. Reducing overall cost. <clears throat> Here's the metrics. Do you know the number of bugs you have, let's say, per month? Of course you do. It's in Jira or Rally or any sort of bug ticketing system you happen to be using. And you also know, with that ticketing system, the actual development and testing hours. Here's two metrics that we can use to say, if we have 10 bugs per month 
on average, let's say just given an average, 10 bugs a month, and the actual development and testing hours is 30 on average. And that means not only development, but also testing and also release. Now, if your project manager won't give you the number, you can generally estimate using $65 an hour, and that's a general functional um, equivalency rate. In other words, for a full-time employee, the general FTE rate is 65 an hour. Oh, it will vary with your company, but it's a pretty standard metric to use. And so now if we look at that, <clears throat> we have 300 hours a month that we are spending on bugs. And so if we take 300 hours times $65 an hour, well, that's $19,000. $500 a month that we are spending. Now, the trick is this. Classify the kinds of bugs you have. Are they data related? Is it environment related? Is it user related? Is it programmer related? Based on these classifications, I can get a good, pretty good guess in terms of saying, well, 50% of those bugs are related to the way the application is built. And if I split the application apart, half of those bugs I could remove. Well, take your 19,500 divided by two, and that's almost $10,000 a month I can save. That's how you end up getting that business metric. Now let's talk about better time to market. <clears throat> well, I have actual development and testing hours, and I know the end-to-end -end calendar time. And so the point is that now that we've split up our application, let's say into four different services or macro services, now I know I can develop four times faster. And these are all theoretical numbers, of course, but it's better than just pulling a number right out of the air. In other words, now that I know the actual development and testing hours, I can say, based on the split of functionality of where we're thinking of dividing up our monolith, we can run these efforts in parallel, therefore increasing time to market. Better user satisfaction is another one that I use my bug categorization for. In other words, please, please, please don't send out a survey. Um, I was gonna say almost, but I would have to say every survey that I've ever taken is bias. In other words, the things I really want to complain about aren't available in the survey to complain about. So don't send out a user satisfaction form. Rather, count the number of bugs, the number of errors that you find in your logs, the number of reported bugs. And if I can reduce those, I know my users will be happy and I have my categorization. We have 10 bugs a month. I know that uh, five of those are due to our tightly coupled monolithic system. It keeps coming down because we're using too many threads and resources. And so I know half of those I can fix and so or, or avoid. And so now, now that's going to be a 50% increase in user satisfaction. And what I usually do on these kind of efforts myself is also start, start tracking performance metrics. What is the duration of each of your major business requests? And I'm gonna to start to do a trend analysis on those. Now, once we start to realize that our performance will be better because we're using fewer virtual machine resources, uh, then I can continue to track those performance metrics. These are two aspects of user satisfaction which we can empirically measure. So these are some tips in terms of forming a business justification. This is a responsibility of every architect. Once we propose an architectural change or an architectural refactoring, it is our responsibility to justify that with business value. So this has been Software Architecture Monday. Thanks for listening and stay tuned next week for another architecture lesson. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.